Good morning, afternoon, or evening, everyone. On behalf of AgriLink, Feed the Future, and the USAID Fall Army Worm Task Force, I would like to welcome you to today's webinar on technologies for managing fall armyworm. This is the first in a three-part webinar series on three consecutive Wednesdays, and we hope you will register for the other webinars as well, which will cover a suite of dissemination tools next week and the essential issue of pesticide use to combat this pest in two weeks. And you can find links to those webinars in the box at the bottom left of your screen, and we'll also make sure to highlight those in the chat box. Uh, so my name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a Knowledge Management and Learning Specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I'll be your webinar facilitator today. So you'll hear my voice periodically session at the end. Before we dive into the content, I'd like to go over just a couple of items to orient you to the webinar. First, please use the chat box to introduce yourself, which many of you have done already, and let us know where you're joining from. The chat box is your main way to communicate today, and we encourage you to use it liberally to post your questions at any point, to share resources, and to discuss this topic with your colleagues. We'll be collecting your questions throughout the webinar, and we'll answer some of them uh, along the way, and the rest will hold till after the presentation. You'll see that there are several uh, key resources available for download in the downloads box on the left of your screen if you'd like to grab a copy. And all of these resources are also posted on AgriLinks on our, our Fall Army Worm uh, resources page. Lastly, we are recording this webinar and we'll email you the recording, transcript, and some additional resources once they're ready. And those will also be posted on AgriLinks. Okay, to bridge into the content, I am going to pull up two poll questions that we had just a couple minutes ago at the beginning as you were joining and reveal the answers to kind of get us rolling into the fall armyworm content. So just a moment, we are pulling these up. Okay. The first question is, to test your knowledge of how fall armyworm affects which crops. And to reveal the answer, um, for the first question, it is actually more than 80 different crops, including grasses, so quite a pervasive pest. And for the second question, what is the economic value in USD of crops damaged by the fall armyworm annually? And we actually, it's actually six billion, which is a crazy answer. I see most people selected 260 million. That was actually my guess. Um, but six billion is the correct answer. All right, we're going to go ahead and hide these poll questions again. And next, I uh, will be bridging into our speakers. So I'm going to introduce uh, our initial speaker who will be giving an introduction, and then he will introduce our further speakers. So I would like to pass the microphone on to Brian Conklin, who is a senior ag advisor for the fall armyworm team at USAID. And he'll be giving an introduction to the topic and to our speakers. Brian? Going on the fall armyworm. Great. Did everybody hear that uh, introduction? It sounds like my microphone was just turned on. I want to welcome everybody to the first of three webinars dealing with the fall armyworm. This first webinar this morning is going to highlight key agricultural technologies that can be used to control the fall armyworm. Our session will also revisit a recent study tour in Brazil where African policymakers had the opportunity to see the impact of these technologies firsthand. Brazil's story is one of agricultural transformation. Fall armyworm is the number one pest confronting farmers in Brazil. And yet, despite this challenge, Brazil has increased its productivity fourfold in the last 40 years and is set to take over U.S. maize production in the next three years. Brazil's agricultural transformation and access to innovative technology came about through key changes in its legal and regulatory environment. These changes opened the door for private sector investment and the technologies that followed. And so policy leadership is critical if these technologies are going to be available in African countries. And I think that's the gist of where we're leading in today's webinar. We want to highlight these technologies. You'll be able to see the advantages. You'll be able to see the weaknesses to some of the technologies. But you have to realize that none of these technologies would be, are going to be available if there isn't uh, a press to making uh, open and transparent changes within the uh, enabling environment for private sector investment. Our first speaker this morning is Dr. Joe Husing. 
Dr. Husing is a USAID's lead scientist and entomologist for the, uh, for the fall armyworm team here in Washington. And he's going to be highlighting this list of technologies being used to address the fall armyworm, all within an integrated pest management framework. Our second speaker will be from Embrapa. Embrapa is Brazil's premier research organization. Dr. Antonio Pacino is a scientist and director of Embrapa Maize and Sorghum. And Dr. Pacino will highlight Brazil's policy leadership and investments in research that have helped them deal effectively with the fall armyworm. These presentations and resources highlighted in the webinar today are going to be available and posted on the AgriLinks website, along with resources that will be uh, highlighted in our webinar a week from today. And so we're going to encourage you to tune in uh, for the next two Wednesdays for webinars that are focusing on fall armyworm and tools that will help you deal with these uh, with this pest effectively. Thank you again for joining us this morning. And with that, I will turn things over to Dr. Husing. Ele já vai começar a falar. Agora o microfone, né? All right, on to you, Joe. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, what we're going to do this morning uh, is, is two things. First, I really want to uh, review a little bit about what we have been doing to build the response. It's going to be a little bit of review, but each time that we have these discussions, we dig a little deeper uh, into the response and then also outline for you where we are in terms of building a toolkit. I want to remind everyone that a group of international experts, including a lot of African scientists, U.S. land-grant university scientists, put together the Fall Armyworm in Africa IPM Technical Guide. Follow the guide. This is the doctrine for the U.S. government response to the Fall Armyworm. And really, the story is, is twofold. It's, it, first, it's one of mitigation. That's the tools we're going to discuss. But it's also one of transformation. Uh, because what we've come to appreciate, especially the agronomists in the room, that uh, we probably should do a better job with our smallholder farmers in teaching them ba basic agronomic practices. Our response is based on integrated pest management. And this is the IPM triangle. This triangle should be your framework. I'm going to uh, use a pointer here. I hope some of you can see it. Mm -hmm. OK. The triangle is not prescriptive in the sense that where each of these pieces belong. Uh, but what helps frame the triangle is what we call your protection goal. So for low resource farmers, commercial farmers in Africa, the protection goal is maize grain. That's what we want to protect. Therefore, it, it makes logical sense that the basis of the response to this pest is host plant resistance. And I'll remind everyone that host plant, re plant resistance includes both conventional breeding as well as biotech solutions. Uh, in the Americas, Brazil and North America, over 85% of farmers choose biotech as, as their response to this and other pests. Another important component of biotech, or I'm sorry, of the integrated pest management triangle are cultural controls. Sometimes we also call this landscape agriculture. If farmers don't choose the right genetics, if they don't adjust the pH of their soil, if they don't use fertilizer, they're going to have a very difficult time controlling this pest. Another important component of the IPM response, and my screen is frozen here. Okay, uh, is biocontrol and. These are things like ants and little wasps that uh, also attack the fall armyworm uh, and suppress those populations. So in many instances, you don't have to, to uh, go to the final solution, which is typically a pesticide treatment. My screen is frozen. Okay. So I want to remind everyone that integrated pest management is really about economics. Uh, some of you have seen this slide before. And you'll see across the bottom in that slide is time. That's the, the, the time that a pest population can build. And then ac across the vertical axis is the number of pests. Uh, so you can kind of see that little uh, sort of wavy line. What that suggests is that pest populations build throughout the season. And there will come a point called the EIL, the economic injury level, 
where the cost, where the loss in grain or the loss in yield is equal to the treatment. Let's say you lose ten dollars to the pest. If a treatment costs ten dollars, that's a break-even point. If you wait until that point to treat or to do something, um, you will be you'll be too slow. And so we have this concept known as the uh, economic threshold. That's the point you need to act. In Africa, that can be a real challenge. It may be as much as a week before you can come in and and treat for this pest. I also want to remind everyone that doing nothing is also an option, but doing nothing also has a cost. Uh, can you advance the slide, please? Okay. The key to this campaign is to scout your field. Scout, assess, decide. Scout, assess, decide. If you look on the left where it says pre-scouting, there are a number of things that you have to do prior to assessing your field that can set you up for success. And again, these are things like the agronomics, fertilizer, et cetera, choosing the right germplasm, host plant resistance, using the, the right and appropriate type of landscape management. Dr. Antonio will talk to you at length about that and how Brazil has done that. And then also these biocontrol options. You've planted your field, you've done everything you can, and now you go out every week and you check your field, you look for this pest. And there's going to be one of two things that happens. Either you don't have a pest problem or you do. Now you've got to decide to do something. This is your economic threshold, your economic injury level. And typically the way that, these, that the response is written is you would spray a pesticide. Remember the way we're setting up integrated pest management to use, be used correctly is we don't want to spray. So we want to take every opportunity to decide not to spray. But at the end of the day, many people will have to. Much of the rest of the seminar, or a good part of it, will be talking about those tools. Pesticides is a big one, but also mechanical controls and biocontrols are also um, other things that can be used. Please don't be confused by the use of the word biocontrol in two different places here. I'll explain that in just a minute. The next slide, please. This is a technology table that we're building. Uh, it will be evergreen. This is not the last version of this that you will see. I'm just going to quickly walk you through this so that you can make sense of it. On the far left column are the technologies, host plant resistance, which I've mentioned, and then the technologies are further broken down where there's additional choices. So there's conventional resistance and GMAs, for example. And then there's your chemistries, your biopesticides, botanicals such as neem and others, biocontrol and landscape management. Uh, in the next column, we uh, outline efficacy. This is just a relative scale of the efficacy. Four is the best. GM crops will completely control this pest. Uh, other solutions will work as well, but not quite as well. We then talk about safety. And throughout the table, we'll use a combination of colors. Green means you're, you can rock and roll. Yellow means you need to be a little careful there, or there's, there's some issues you need to address. And then red's a watch out. So for conventional pesticides, um, personal, protection, personal protective equipment is important. We then have a, a set of columns on cost. That I think that's self-explanatory. And as Brian mentioned, uh, that final big block there, needs prior to implementation are largely around things like infrastructure and policy. Uh, so for example, GM crops, even though that's the major uh, way that farmers in the Americas control the, the pests is an issue in Africa because policy needs to be addressed. Likewise, that's also an issue, although not as great with pesticides. Next slide, please. What I want to do is maybe talk about two or three of these tools just to kind of walk you through the, the kind of decision process you'll use as a practitioner. Um, this is host plant resistance, conventional and genetically modified. There is a lot of good germplasm out there with decent resistance against the fall armyworm. It can be effective and it's very safe to use. The farmer just puts a seed in the ground essentially. Some of the constraints, however, are that these technologies are largely in hybrid maize and they're regulated. These are regulated articles of commerce. Even conventional uh, seeds are, are regulated. Uh, and so again, the policy issue is a big one here. Next slide, please. I want to talk about two different types of biocontrol. There's natural and there's augmentative. And so, the, so a natural type of biocontrol is what you see here. These are all the good, what they, saw, what they call the so-called good guys, ants and ladybird beetles and things that will feed on 
uh, fall army war. But of course, every technology has its ups and its downs. Uh, the ups on, on this is that they do feed on fall army worm. The bad side is they feed on everything. Um, the, the, good, uh, the good predator insects will also feed on other predators. They tend to only be really effective when pest populations are high. They're also very hard to predict in terms of their efficacy. Next slide, please. Biocontrol can also be used almost like a pesticide. Uh, this is an example that Brazil uses as trichogramma. This is this little tiny wasp that gets onto eggs, uh, the fall armyworm, and stings it and effectively kills it. Uh, and these are released inundatively, weekly. They're raised in what is called a biofactory, and they're taken to the field. The timing is pretty critical for their use. Now, the constraint to that, of course, is you have to have a biofactory. These are also regulated. And there's a, a lot of infrastructure in terms of perhaps getting these to the field. So again, this is another consideration that you need to make. Next slide, please. The biggest part of this response, as you might guess, in the absence of conventional or GM technologies are pesticides. And the key things that we have to address here are the active ingredient. What you're spraying is important. All homeowners know this. Efficacy. Hazard and exposure, how poisonous is it, and will I be exposed to it? Quality is a big issue across the continent, fraud, as well as cost. And I kind of like just broke this into maybe three categories. The first are the synthetics. There's some very, very good tech, um, um, new chemistries coming out. For Tenzadua is one, Uphold is a misspelling there is another. These are primarily based on biopesticide type formulations. Uh, as well as with other uh, formulations that will make them very effective. There are botanicals. You all know of these. Neem is probably the biggest one that's used. Just remember, neem is based on an active ingredient as a directin. If people brew this up on their farm, you don't know what the level of, the, of that uh, active ingredient is. There are others that are being used, such as uh, tephrosia. Just recall, even though this is a natural pesticide, uh, it does kill fish. It's to very toxic to fish. And finally, there are several good biopesticides that are available, and this is something that we're working on right now um, with policymakers. Next slide, please. Where we're at in this campaign, one, one before that. One right before where we're at in this campaign right now with the, with the pesticides is we're at the risk and assessment and field data stage where we've gone in and we've looked and, and we're doing this work in conjunction with USDA FAS uh, as well as University of Oregon, uh, University of Florida where fall armyworm is endemic, uh, as well as our own BEOs and MEOs in the, in the Bureau. We've looked at 61 pesticides that are recommended against fall armyworm. We've identified eight already that are highly hazardous. We want those to go away. We're working with policymakers on that. We've got another bucket that have a high risk to either aquatic life, wildlife, pollinators, or biocontrol agents. We want to limit their use. We've scaled this bucket down to 10 to 15 that are lower risk uh, uh, for especially low resource farmers. And finally, what we're trying to come up with is this list of six to 10 efficacious, low-risk pesticides that farmers can use. And remember, for our clientele, uh, Africa has a lot of very good commercial farmers. It has a whole lot of low-resource farmers that don't have protective equipment. They don't have training. And this is a bucket of materials we want to use for them. So in conclusion, last slide, please. Follow the pest management guide. There are a lot of guides out there. This is a guide that's our official doctrine. All of our sort of supporting material, pest management decision guides, et cetera, that will be talked about next uh, in a week or so or two, uh, are drawn from this. A lot of other guides look similar. Don't be fooled. This is a real deal. Uh, follow the IPM triangle. It's the key. This is about scouting and economics. Get out of your field early and often, and technologies are the key. Uh, do, am I supposed to now introduce Dr. Antonio? You can pass it to Brian. Okay, Brian, yes. I'm going to pass it back over to, to you go. now to hand off to Dr. Antonio. Thank you. Joe, th thank you very much, Joe. We appreciate the, the presentation. And I just want to remind everybody that the field guide that Joe was referring to is it's on the AgriLinks website. Uh, Joe's presentation and especially that technology that table that Joe 
put up there that was very difficult to see will be available as well. So we're going to make these resources available. Uh, we'll be highlighting in depth some of these uh, resources next week. Let me turn the conversation over to Dr. Antonio Procino, uh, the head of uh, Embrapa's Maize and Sorghum Unit, and he's going to highlight how some of these technologies have brought about Brazil's transformation, as well as uh, some of the po key policies and resources that led to that transformation. Dr. Antonio? Yes, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to our webinar. And I'm going to talk about uh, corn production in Brazil over the last uh, four years and was what has happened in Brazil during this period of time uh, with uh, increased crop production, although we have had all along the way several, um, uh, the presence of several uh, insect pests, including uh, fall armyworm. Uh, the reason for this conference is that uh, fall armyworm was recently found in, in Africa, and a lot of people are concerned with the, the presence of fall armyworm in uh, African agriculture. What I would like to mention is that fall armyworm has been in Brazil for many, many, many years, and, uh, and although it has been here with several other insect pests, Brazil has been able to change from a you know, backward uh, technology uh, agriculture to a modern country producing its own food and excess food, food and produce to, to export. Uh, but that, uh, on my next slide, please. Can I have my next slide, please? Certainly, Antonio. Okay, this is you can either say, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you can either say next okay, slide. Okay, okay. Now I can go here. Or, yes. or Justin, yourself. Uh, this, is a, this is Embrapa maize and sorghum, uh, which is also uh, 40 years old. And uh, it represents the changes that were made in, in Brazil concerning agriculture. Brazil is a, a, an agriculture country. And four years ago, we were importing food. We were not able to produce our own food. And uh, the decision was made by, by our policymakers to invest in agriculture research and training our scientists. Most of our scientists were trained abroad. And they, upon returning to Brazil, they developed, they began to develop tropical agriculture adapted to Brazilian conditions. And, uh, and in this slide, you see a small farm in Brazil several years ago. Uh, you see uh, uh, a crop with, uh, which you know it's going to have low yields, uh, very few uh, people working on it, and uh, no machinery. And uh, the yields were very low. Uh, if this picture is from the 70s, this uh, crop will, would yield uh, no, no more than two tons per hectare. So Brazil began to invest in technology and uh, capacity building. This is very important. Uh, so uh, we, we could uh, make the, the revolutions that, that we made in terms of uh, crop production. This is, uh, there are two pictures of uh, modern agriculture in Brazil. Uh, you can see here, it's the uh, first thing that we did was to construct soil fertility and uh, been able to develop uh, new uh, genetic resources, new cultivars and to control pests, including fall army worm. So we increased our crop yields and crop production by several fold. And as a result of that, the cost of the basket food uh, decreased by 50%. So families in Brazil uh, from the 70s to the 2000s 2018 are now spending much less money for buying food than they used to have to spend uh, 
uh, 20 years ago. So they have more money for other uh, applications. So they have more money for uh, education, for housing, for house care. So it was a very decision to invest in technology, develop public policies, and to incentivate increased crop production in, in Brazil. And we changed from a, a food importing country to a food exporting country. Uh, and here you have some figures about corn production in the world. Uh, last year we produced uh, over 1 billion, 1, uh, 1,000 metric tons of, of corn. Of course, the USA is the number one, 370 million tons of corn. China is the second, 215 million tons, metric tons of corn. But again, uh, the U.S. is a, a net exporter of corn, 50 million tons per year. And China is not. But China is a buyer of corn. And here you see Brazil with 88 million metric tons. And uh, we have, uh, years before, we had produced over 100 million uh, metric tons of corn, which make us now the third producer in terms of corn and the second corn export. So this is a big change from the, the 80s. And, and again, fall armyworm was here all along. And we developed the technology to control these insect pests. And Joe mentioned about several of these technologies that were developed or introduced into Brazil. Um, here in Brazil, corn is not used for, for, for food, for human nutrition. It's mostly used for, for feed. And 45% goes to chicken, 20% to pork, and 7% for meat production, 5% to other uses. But I would like to point that uh, Brazil was a food exporter, importer, I mean, 10 years ago, and today we are now exporting about 30 million tons of corn per year. So that was a big change that was made by uh, using adapted technology to the tropical environment and the use of uh, modern uh, technology and innovation. This is very important, not only to develop these technologies, but to invest in trained and capable people to bring this changes in the field. And I also would like to mention that uh, the entrepreneurship of, of Brazilian farmers were very important in bringing out these uh, changes that happened in Brazil in terms of uh, food production. Uh, now we have a, a very intensive production system in Brazil. And I uh, quickly point that uh, uh, one big change is that we are having uh, uh, no tillage systems, more, uh, cropping rotating system, and crop uh, succession system, and uh, we develop a second, uh, a second uh, growing season. Uh, for instance, if you grow only soybeans in a field during the rainy season, your your soils will be occupied only 42 percent of the time. But if you grow corn, your, field will, your soils will be occupied by 50% of the time. But if you grow soybeans, if you plant soybeans during the rainy season, and then if you grow corn right before, right after harvesting your soybean, you occupy your, your soils by 80% of the time. But now Brazil is investing in a system where you grow corn, uh, soybeans, and then you harvest your soybeans. You grow corn uh, in consortium with, uh, with a brachiaria or some kind, of, some kind of grass. And then you can use uh, your soils by 92% of the soils. So you see this is a much better use of your 
natural resource, is your major resource, which is the soil that you grow your, your crops. I, I mentioned that uh, a second crop appeared in Brazil during the 80s. You see the, the bars, uh, with the yellow bars mean that uh, uh, it's a, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the rainy season growing of corn and the, the, the red bar means that uh, uh, the second corn uh, growing uh, grow. Uh, so you see that the, 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 the red bar is becoming you know, more important than the yellow one. So we are now in a system where we grow uh, more corn during our second season than during the rainy season. Uh, using short season varieties of both soybeans and uh, uh, and corn, and so this this is how it goes here in Brazil. The safrinha, the second the second uh, crop. You see, this uh, corn planting machine here on on your left is uh, planting corn over corn over left over by the machine that is harvesting soybeans. So we are doing this, the two operations at the same time uh, so we can use better use soil moisture. So we are harvesting soybeans and that was planted during the rainy season and immediately growing or planting corn over the corn stover. And uh, this picture here, you know, these bars here, the green and the yellow bars, are mean to say that uh, we are now using shorter season crops so we can make better use of the soil and of the uh, rainfall and the water that is stored in the soil. Okay, we, we, we said that uh, uh, insect pests are very important uh, problems for the farmers uh, in the tropics, more so than in the temperate environments. But it's not only uh, feasible to get good uh, production, good yields, and uh, if you invest only in uh, insect control, you have to invest in several uh, fields, in several technologies so you can uh, really increase uh, crop production. And you do this uh, using new technology, develop new technology, training and capacitating people, and developing a legal basis for this, a legal framework for the use of these uh, technologies. Uh, regulation rules has, has to be put in place for the use of fertilizer, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, including uh, transgenic, uh, transgenic uh, materials. So Brazil uh, also developed these uh, policies, this, uh, this legal framework to bring about these changes that uh, we were able to, to, to do over the last uh, few years. Um, in terms of genetics, I said that 40 years ago our uh, crop varieties were very low uh, yielding. Today we have extremely good uh, varieties, genetics, and this was uh, done by not only by Embrapa, but the private sector, by the universities, and by the, you know, the seed companies. And they introduced it in Brazil in 2006, 2006 uh, transgenic crops, and this was a major a change, a major breakthrough for the control of fowl armyworm. Uh, I'm not saying that there's a single sil silver bullet to control fowl armyworm in the tropics because resistance will be developed and you have to use several of the technologies that Joe Hissing mentioned to you uh, so you can uh, cope with the problem of uh, resistance for any of these technologies that are available, you know, transgenic, agrochemicals, and biologicals. Okay. 
Another big thing that happened in Brazil was uh, the adoption of the no tillage system and crop rotation. This is very important because at the end of the growing season, you have very low uh, water in the soil. So growing your, uh, planting your soybean or your corn over, on, over uh, uh, the stove that was left over from previous crop is very important. So the no tillage system in Brazil occupies about 32 million hectares of land in Brazil. And this is a major change this has to be done if you're looking for good yields, and it's possible to do. I'm not saying that it's easy to do if, you're, if your soils are too dry, but this is the way that you have to go in order to have uh, good uh, yields in, in the tropics. Um, another major recent changes in Brazil is, not, is that we are not only rotating corn and soybeans. We are introducing trees in our system. And in this picture, you will see trees in the back, soybeans, and corn. And this machine here is harvesting uh, corn that was uh, sown or, or cultivated with brachiaria. It's uh, harvesting uh, corn. And you see the brachiaria is left behind, and you can uh, feed your cows or your bulls here for three months. You can fatten them, and you have another source of income along with the trees. And after you uh, use this uh, brachiaria for three months, you can uh, desiccate it with a herbicide, and then you have the, the stover for growing the next uh, crop. OK, here is a picture where, where we have the, you know, the corn planting, the serving harvest. Uh, uh, and then what happened, you see the back area is left in the field. We have the green bridge. The green bridge is a solution, but it's also a problem because the fall army worm is, well, will feed on the, on the back area. And you have to control uh, fall army worm and on this. Uh, brachiaria. So before you go for the next crop, you have to desiccate it and use some kind of protection against fall army worm. Uh, it can be either a chemical or a biological insecticide. But yeah, as you can see, this is a very intensive use of uh, the soil. Uh, this is about what I would like to tell you this time. And I thank you very much for your attention. And I hope that the information that I pass on to you uh, will be helpful to your country. Thank you very much. Great. We want to thank you, Dr. Antonio, for your presentation and for highlighting the, uh, the transformation that's taking place in Brazil. Uh, just to highlight a couple of things that he said, dealing with fall armyworm in the tropics is something that Brazil has done effectively. And it's, it's happened through the use of several technologies. And I think Dr. Joe Husing highlighted those technologies and talked about yes. the importance of an integrated pest management concept. I want to bring this back to the fact that Brazil's transformation came about because they opened the door for the right policies in place and the private and private sector investment and research that, that followed. We're going to move on from here on to some questions and answers. And so there's, there are a lot of great questions out there, and unfortunately, it's uh, uh, there's only a, about 15 minutes left in this podcast in this webinar, so there won't be time to answer all of them through our uh, presentation today. But my understanding is that uh, all of your questions and answers will be provided uh, in a future document that we'll produce. So let me turn this back over to to Julie McCarty. Thank you so much, Brian. And that's correct. We'll spend about 15 minutes getting through as many questions as we can. And any that we weren't able to address, we'll do our best to share them in a Q&A document along with the post-event resources. All right, so looking back towards Joe's presentation, uh, Bob Robatsky asked, how do you plan to promote and distribute the 6 to 10 efficacious and low-risk pesticides uh, to smallholders in Africa? Um, and in addition, it, it seems that it might be related to also ask a second question from Muni Munipan, 
do you follow the PERSWAP approved by BSS and USAID? And if you wouldn't mind letting us know, what, what is a PERSWAP? Well, uh, so USAID uh, has a set of regulations that it has to address uh, around environmental issues, uh, a, a big one of which is our pesticides. And so there, without going into a lot of detail, there are a series of documents, a per swap is one, which outlines which, uh, which chemistries, which active ingredients, and how those are used can be used on a crop. Uh, and to make a long story short, there is a fall armyworm per swap that covers the continent. Uh, as well as uh, different per swaps for, for different projects. And that's something that uh, we'll, we'll address that in more detail at the next, uh, in, in the, uh, next webinar. All right. And um, I think the other question was how do people get access to Yes, about okay. the, the six so, to ten efficacious ones. That's right. So a, a couple of things that you have to appreciate. So pesticides in any country are regulated by the government of that country. They're regulated in terms of their active ingredients, their formulation, and the crops that you can use them on. That's why policy is so important. The newest and best pesticides were not available for use in Africa uh, because they were labeled in the first world and, and sometimes were more expensive. A key stakeholder in this campaign is the private sector. The private sector makes and designs the tools, and the private sector disseminates the tools. And so a, a second policy component um, in this campaign is allowing the private sector, the term that's typically used as enabling environment, to make those tools available to farmers. Um, I think even at aid, people were shocked at how quickly the private sector responded to this problem in terms of getting the sa more safer pesticides available, getting training available, repackaging materials for smallholder farmers so that they could be in quantities that they could easily use and afford. Great, thank you, Joe. And uh, a slightly related question, or set of questions that I wanted to pose to Brian uh, came from Owen Okoko from Congo Brazzaville and Debbie Adebowale. How might we work to spread the word to rural farmers uh, for whom technology penetration is still low about these technologies? And in a related fashion, are there any existing training tools that capacity experts can use to effectively communicate to smallholder farmers um, about these technologies and recognizing that smallholder farmers constitutes a major population of West African farmers? So, so these are great questions, and I think this is the big challenge that, that we're up against with, uh, with the farm arms. How do we get our messages out to, to various farmers, and particularly how do we deal with low resource farmers that uh, have limited access to a lot of these technologies? And I think this will be the piece that, we're, that we'll continue to deal with and that you out in the field will, will continue to deal with as well. We're, we're working on this through a couple of different paths. The first is we're trying to develop a set of tools that are available for the, for the continent. And it starts with the guide that Joe highlighted at the beginning of his presentation. And then in the next webinar, and this is a bit of a commercial for the next webinar that's coming up a week from today, we've developed a set of uh, tools that are helpful at the country level, including the guide that Joe has highlighted. But we've also developed pest management decision guides that are country specific, and they go into detail, uh, even down to the level of uh, safe or not so safer pesticides that are available in specific countries, as well as uh, uh, decisions that policymakers can use. When it when it comes to low resource farmers, though, it's a challenge, and we've uh, we're going to be highlighting a um, an animation that we've developed on scouting that's that's well designed for, for lower resource farmers. It can be translated into multiple languages quite easily. So stay tuned for that in the next pot and the next webinar. We'll be highlighting some of these tools and what we have available. But at the end of the day, I think it's, it's about building partnerships with a broad coalition of, um, of partners that are out there to reach low resource farmers with, uh, with the tools that are available. And none of these tools are going to be available if, if we don't get the policy leadership that we need. So let me go back and, and reemphasize that. I'll turn this back over to you, Julie. Thank you so much, Brian. Uh, Antonio, I'd, I'd love to throw a question out to you. And several people had versions of this question. 
Uh, but could you elaborate a bit on how you think that how the Brazilian system of crop intensification might translate into regions with similar climates in Africa and elsewhere? So you've learned so much from Brazil, but some people are interested in a few tips for translating this to the African context. how we can adapt this uh, technologies that we're developing, you know, the second crop in Brazil to, to Africa? Is this a question? Yes, I'd say that's it. Okay, I see. We don't have two uh, rainy seasons in Brazil. What we are doing is to make use, a better use of the rainy season that we have. We have rainfall if in Brazil from um, at uh, the end of uh, October to somewhere in, uh, in March. And what we have done is to uh, use technology that will uh, prevent the, the, the water from running off, uh, to keep the water in the soil, to storage the water in the soil, you know, planting on stove. And we are also using uh, short season crops, short season soybeans, and short season um, corn. And we plant corn right, right after harvesting uh, soybeans. So uh, we do that on a very short period of time. We understand that we could get much better, much higher yield for corn if corn were planted during the rainy season. But the importance is not to, uh, to make money on corn or soybean. It's to improve the yield and of the whole system. We're, we think about system, crop rotation, crop su succession, and not only growing one crop. We, of course, could produce more soybeans and more uh, corn per hectare, but when you have a system of growing them together or in rotation and in succession in the same rainy season, you can make more money. It's more profitable. And we get about 1,200 millimeters of uh, rainfall a year. That's what we have here. Hello. Thank you very much, Dr. Antonio. Uh, let's see, another question came in uh, from Muni Munipan. Uh, a quick question about what about other crops other than maize attacked by fall armyworm? The technology table that you shared, Joe, is that only for maize? Oh, you want me to? Oh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, okay. Yeah, um, so remember that the fall armyworm can attack over 80 different crops, but it primarily attacks maize. That's what it likes. This is an animal that can fly 1,000 kilometers and find a cornfield. You're not going to hide from it. And so, um, and so the pesticides, again, are registered as a function of the AI formulation and the, um, and, and the crop that you're going to use it on. So other crops that are attacked uh, include, for example, sorghum in particular, uh, but also rice. We also now have the southern armyworm on Africa. It eats everything that fall armyworm doesn't, and so every crop out there, tomato, is going to have to deal with these issues. So as a general rule, the pesticides that are labeled for fall armyworm will work on other crops, but you have to have those labeled in the country where you purchase them, and that is part of this policy issue that we're, we're trying to uh, address. Obviously, if the pest wasn't in the country, the country didn't bother registering it for that use, and so there's a bit of a catch-up that has to take place there. Over. Thank you, Joe. Yes. And Thank another you. quick uh, question for you, Joe, from Claude Nancom. So are there still not very good resistant non-GM maize varieties? So uh, very good question. Remember, the fall armyworm is new to Africa. It's not new to the Americas. We've been fighting the fall armyworm since the 1700s. There's very, very good germplasm available from Simit that's resistant to the fall armyworm. The, at this point of the campaign, what is being evaluated is, is the germplasm in Africa drawn from the same germplasm that's used in the Americas for resistance to the fall armyworm. Simit and IITA are working very hard on that, 
as is, as is the private sector. We've sent people to USDA laboratories, for example, in uh, Mississippi where they breed this material, and, and that's an ongoing exercise. We expect uh, that that material could be available in as short as one to two years. Again, varietal trials are, are required by governments and are required by uh, specific countries. So again, this is another policy issue that has to be addressed in terms of expediting getting that material to farmers. Did you want me to also answer the question about the crop rotations, et cetera? Sure, let me go ahead and pose that. There were a couple of questions, um, I think appreciating Brazil's approach, but wondering, um, Sorry, it just got uh, moved from my questions box. Let me find that again. All right, um, one, uh, could crop rotation uh, in combination with maize reduce the risk of fall armyworm infection? And also, could a second corn season actually increase the risk of fall armyworm infection? Yeah, so in, in terms well, of... If you rotate soybeans with corn, it will decrease it will help to keep uh, fall armyworm at a lower level. Great. So Antonio, Crop the rotation is the key for the system to work. Re reduces the risk. Excellent. Uh, on, uh, so the second question, could actually having two corn crops then uh, in a single season increase the risk? No, this is not a good idea. This is not a good agriculture procedure to have corn after corn not only because you increase the, the, uh, the problem with insect pests, but also you increase the problem with diseases. You are accumulating diseases in the same area. So crop rotation and crop succession is, a, is the key, uh, uh, two key factors for the success of, of the system of, that we have uh, for growing two crops per, per season. Uh, thank you very much, Antonio. Okay. All right, I'm trying to see if we can squeeze a couple more questions in. Let's see. Uh, Joe Harris Ayuk uh, from CNFA Liberia asked, "Can the most improved and pest-resistant corn uh, corn feed grow under tropical weather, for example, in Liberia?" Yeah, the answer is yes, because what, what breeders do is take the germplasm and they select it for use in any, any particular environment. That, that's, breeders have been doing that for almost 30,000 years, so they're, they're pretty good at it. Um, what, what takes a while is to actually go through the cycles of checking the material and the back crossing, et cetera. And, and, and then a final thing that makes this very difficult in, in the African context is the rate that African smallholder farmers are switching from open pollinated varieties to hybrid maize. So hybrid maize has a lot of qualities that make it far superior to open pollinated varieties just in terms of yield, forget about fall armyworm, um, which would help compensate for a lot of these issues. So, uh, and a lot of the germplasm in the Americas is in, in, in hybrid backgrounds. Still, breeders know how to deal with that, and they know how to, how to make that material available for low-resource farmers anywhere. Thank you, Joe. And let me toss another quick question to you from Aline Rendell Montero. How effective is the biological control of fall armyworm? So biological control is a pillar of integrated pest management. You have to have it. You have to enhance it, and you, and you have to have it available. It suppresses pest populations. We wouldn't be having this conversation about fall armyworm being a major pest in India and Africa and the New World if biocontrol always worked. It frequently doesn't. Uh, and so that's why it's key to teach low-resource farmers how to be good farmers. They have to get out and check their fields. They have to use practices that enhance biocontrol, they have to increase fertility of the soil, they have to fertilize, but at the end of the day, they're gonna check that field and some portion of them are gonna find everything didn't work. For whatever reason, it didn't work. Now they have to take a decision. They gonna treat or are they not gonna treat? That's an economic decision and it is partially driven by availability of the tools that, that we discussed today. Okay. Thank you, Joe. 
All right, we're just about at time, but I do want to pass one last question over to you, Antonio. And that is that Brazil yes. achieved an impressive ag transformation. If we engage policymakers in our country, what is the key message we need to emphasize to facilitate their role in transformation? Well, I think uh, I think one of the major uh, changes that helped Brazil increase crop production was to uh, finish, to end up with subsidies. Subsidies were not a good uh, thing here in Brazil. When farmers were using their own money to grow their own crops, they became more professional and more efficient. But then in terms of uh, agronomic uh, facts, uh, the first thing that uh, made uh, a large change was to uh, build soil fertility, uh, liming and fer fer using fertilizers, and then uh, access to uh, uh, good seeds, uh, seed genetics. And of course, planting your, your seeds during the right time of the year. So uh, public policies were, were very important. Uh, we have policies for the right use of agrochemicals, and uh, the uh, policies for the use of uh, uh, transgenics. And I think uh, Joe mentioned that. You have to register your chemicals for, for certain crops. You know, the chemicals there are approved for, for corn. Maybe they are not approved for, for sorghum. So you have to work on this. You have to test it. You have to develop. And uh, you have to learn how to mix them if it, this is allowed to mix uh, chemicals to control uh, insect pests. Thank you so okay. much, Antonio. Okay. I'm going to pass it to Joe for okay. a little Antonio, time. thank you for that. One of the messages that we heard in Brazil, all my African friends that were on that Brazil trip, they really resonated with them was something Antonio said a couple times, and that is that one of the keys of Brazil's transformation is the, the policymakers became enablers rather than blocking technologies. And so the, the policymakers, you know, in many developing countries, policymakers can be very patronizing, and they decide for farmers what technologies they, they can use. Brazil and, uh, and much of the rest of the developed world, the policymakers make the tools available and let the farmers vote what they think are the best technologies to use. And I think that's a, that's a key policy change that would help uh, if that were implemented. Over. Thank you so much. All right, we are at the end of our webinar time slot, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap things up. There were a lot of questions we didn't have a chance to answer, and so we're going to do our best to um, send those questions to the presenters and get them answered in writing for all of you uh, as part of our post-webinar resources. And remember to be on the lookout in your email. We will send you the recording of this webinar when it is ready. Uh, please do register for the next webinar, next Wednesday and the following Wednesday. Uh, the links to those are on the top left of your screen. And uh, lastly, I would just like to extend a sincere thank you to our presenters, uh, Joe and Antonio, and of course, Brian, um, for your excellent presentations, for answering the questions so deftly. And I would, of course, like to thank the AgriLinks Agri team for your excellent support of the webinar today. So we will see you next week, and on behalf of the U.S.